Hello, greetings from Berkshire Guitar Amplifier Repairs in Reading, England. Stuart Smith here as always. And on the bench today we have a Galleon Kruger 700RB. Not an amp I'm familiar with, it's a bass head. There's a combo version of it as well. Uh, bad news on this amp. He said he was uh, just kind of playing on his computer and the amp was in the background on standby or, or mute in this particular case and uh, he, he smelt this kind of burning smell and heard this horrible crackling sound smoke poured out of the amplifier and he rushed over to turn it off which is interesting but he wasn't even using it at the time I don't, so I don't know what's gone wrong there now immediately let me say to you I'm not relishing this job I almost didn't take it on for several reasons first of all this is a Galleon Kruger amp and uh, I don't know what it is about GK, but they make it exceptionally difficult to work on their amplifiers. It's almost as though they're perverse in that respect and make it very, very difficult for a technician to either get into the amp or work on it. That's been my experience with them. Um, secondly, this is an all transistor amp, and I prefer to work on valve amps. And thirdly, this is a 500 watt amp. So I immediately thought Class D but the client um, immediately assured me that it was a uh, full analogue and not Class D. I must have been a little bit sceptical, but I had to take his word for it. And sure enough, it is full analogue. And the only way you get 500 watts out of full analogue is to have just rows and rows and rows of high-power tip transistors, you know, MOSFETs and all that sort of stuff. And I hate working on that kind of thing because um, usually they're bolted on some huge, immense heat sink. You can't get to the things. You can't change them. And I just, just in general, I don't like working on this kind of amp. Anyway, I agreed to have a kind of a look, look, at, look, see, see if there's anything obvious. No fee if I don't fix it. You know, you never know, there might be a capacitor blown up inside or something. So, anyway, let's get the lid off this, have a look inside, see if my fears are confirmed, and see if we can find out uh, where this smoke has been coming from. Well, my fears were confirmed before I even took the lid off, because this had 18 screws just holding the lid on. Okay, fine. You, you may not worry too much about that, but the screws were in so tight that I had to use a special long screwdriver, put the amp down on the floor and put all my body weight behind the screwdriver and only just managed to undo them. They were torqued down to something absolutely ridiculous. I was very fearful of stripping the heads off them. I mean, why would you do that? But that's just typical of GK. I've never had a piece of GK equipment like that I could just get into and service. Anyway, uh, enough moaning. So the lid, lid come off now and let's have a little look inside. Right, what have we got here? We have big fat toroidal transformer, of course. Lots of uh, heavy diode rectification there. And some smoothing caps. They, they're not bulging. So I'm not suspecting smoothing caps at this stage. Um, printer circuit board actually doesn't look too bad. In terms of getting the printer circuit board out, it looks sort of possible. A few screws and maybe take all this furniture off here. Hopefully the board will just come out. All right, let's see if we can see any kind of... Nothing obvious in terms of anything that's blown up. Under here, of course, we have the, as I said, huge great big heat sink. And, oh yes, look what we've got along here. Transistor, transistor, well, power, power transistor, power transistor, power transistor, power transistor, power transistor, power transistor, power transistor. And it'll be exactly the same the other side. Well, it's not exactly the same, but we've got three of them there. So that's the, that's the only method you can get hundreds of watts out of an amp like this. Um, right, so, it all looks okay though. I mean, I suppose some of those transistors could have blown up. Again, you know, you've got the usual problem. You've got this huge heat sink, not easy to get to those transistors even if you wanted to replace them. Ah, oh, interesting, I've just spotted something. Okay, look at this little device here. That's looking quite burnt there. And, oh yes, look, see the carbon deposit on those caps there? And the more I look at this, the more I can see that this uh, chip here is, is completely blown apart. There's a big crack across it there. So this is the thing that's gone poof and emitted all the smoke. There's nothing else obviously wrong. Now, I'm a little bit uh, curious here. This is an 
LM3886T, which from memory is some kind of power, audio power amplifier on a chip. This sort of thing you put in a hi-fi amp, you know, one, one there for the left, one there for the right, and you've got yourself a hi-fi amp. It'll be 20 watts, 30 watts, 40 watts, I don't know exactly, i have to look it up. But it certainly isn't 400 watts, so how how is this amp working? Is that driving these power transistors somehow? In other words, initial doesn't seem right. I think I'm going to have to do a little bit more research to find out what this chip, why they've got a 30 watt amplifier stuck there. Um, right, so obviously that's gone faulty, but the trouble is what else has gone faulty and why did that blow up? It was just sitting there minding its own business and it went kapoom. Um, could be one of those things, I don't know. But the thing I don't like about these sort of amps is you can spend a lot of time and effort replacing something like that only to turn it on, it goes kapoom again, you know, and then you're involved in taking all this lot off, trying to find out if all these power resistors, plus their support circuitry, um, has gone down. And I, I really dislike working on amps like this. But anyway, let's see what the customer wants to do and take it from there. OK, we have a bit more information. So this is a 68 watt audio amplifier chip capable of delivering 68 watts continuously. Rather amazing, isn't it? And that chip there. Um, and uh, the customer says this is a bi amp, which means it's got two amplifiers in one, and that this probably does the tweeters. So I agree with him on that. I think this is a dedicated amplifier chip for the tweeters only. Not particularly easy to test because the tweeters aren't bought out on a separate connector, so that you can, um, you know, replace that chip, plug a tweeter in, and see if it's working. They come out on these four-pin um, speak-on connectors. Normally a speak on connects just two pin, it's just a fancy loudspeaker connection, but these four pin ones can be used to give you two outputs, one for the subs and one for the tweeters, and um, I don't know what pins there are on there, it's not going to be easy for me to test that, so if I do get involved in replacing that, he's going to have to bring the cab over and we're going to um, have to hook it, hook it up to the cab and see what's wrong there. I don't think there'd be anything wrong with this cab, because these sort of things are always short circuit protected. You can't just short the output and blow the chip up. They're pretty pretty good, these type of things. So why that's failed, you know, we don't know. However, what I'm going to do now is to uh, take a bit of a risk and power the amp up and see if the main amp is working. So see if we if the heavy lifting stuff is all working, and it's just the tweeter I see that's failed. So then we can give the customer some options. Does he want to just take the amp as it is and just use this side of the amp, or does he want to get involved in the expense of changing that chip, which won't be particularly cheap. So let's do that next. Let's power up the amp and see if we get lucky and that the main amplifier is working and it's only the tweeter that's failed. Right, we've got the amp wired up. We've got power going in, we've got a speaker going in, we've got a signal going in. And I've got it set up on the Variac to uh, 130 volts, so in other words, quite a low voltage in case it all goes poof. Nothing special about 130, just random. So let's turn it on. No smoke. Oh, well, that's good. Oh, I can hear a tone. Okay, that's good. Right, so. Good, so the main amplifier section is working. It's just the tweeter. So now that we know that the main amplifier is working, and the only thing that's wrong is this chip here, um, I just happened to look in my stock of chips, and absolutely amazingly, I've got two of them in stock, which is extraordinary. I wouldn't have thought I had a 65 watt power chip but I do so that what I need to do now is ask the customer does he want to take the amp as it is and uh, just pay me for the 
small amount of time I've spent on it. Um, I've checked the high frequency range and it's got a very, very good high frequency range out of the main power amp. So it's not as though you must have a high frequency tweeter output. In other words, it's not just the fact that this handles only the bass and rolls off at about 3 kilohertz or something. It's got an excellent high frequency response. So you could plug this into any cabinet and, um, and run it perfectly well. So I just need to find out, does he want to go to the expense now of changing this, with the caveat that I might change that chip and it might blow up again or it just might not work um, through having taken out a load of other stuff. And I don't really want to get involved in that. We won't be able to get a schematic for this, so um, you know we can only do the basics. So I will go away and ask him now what he wants to do and report back to you. OK, I've had a word with the customer and he is happy to go ahead and change that chip on spec. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we have to just revert back to the main amplifier, and he's willing to pay for that whether it works or not, which is good, um, because there's a fair bit of work involved here. So I have to now take this board out, take all the furniture off the back. All the connections to the board are here, so I'm hoping... Um, well, it's just one or two here. I can just obviously quickly unplug these, and I'm hoping just to be able to kind of swing the board up that way to work on it without un without taking any of this lot out. Uh, although, you know, this unplugs, so that's not going to be too much of a problem. Then, um, let me tell you the technique for this. The best way of tackling this, oh, I'm just looking, it's not particularly easy. I was going to say, just chop along those, um, those connectors there, you know, just cut them with a pair of cutters, which is fine, but of course that leaves you with the back row there. It may be that I can get, I don't think I can get in there. Uh, so that's going to be a bit awkward to, to 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 take this out. I'm going to have to try and desolder those connections. Anyway, it's, never, it's not going to be easy, of course. <laughs> Why would it be easy? So let's uh, go ahead now. I think I'll make a start on dismantling and see if we can get one of those in there and see if the amp works again. So we'll make a start on this by taking out the board screws. I'll make it four board screws. I wouldn't be surprised if GK didn't have some tricks up their sleeve yet to prevent a tech from working on this amp. Actually it's only two board screws, there's one at either end here. I've opened up GK amps in the past, you know, take all the stuff off and then you get inside. And you, there's another chassis over the over the over the works with you know virtually impossible to get to screws and virtually impossible to remove kind of sub chassis over here. Ugh, it's just not good. Right, so now I'm going to take off all this front this back panel furniture here. And um, I'll, I'll do that off camera because it's a little bit awkward to do on camera. Basically, basically, it's four screws here and these nuts and that nut and bolt there. Then we can see if anything, if the if the actual board comes free and allows us to come this way. I can immediately see this is in the way here, stopping the board coming this way. <laughs> um, don't even know what that is. Why would they put that there? It's not a... Um, I wouldn't have thought it was hum protection, because I'd expect that to be down at the input end. This is at the power supply end here. No idea, just another GK thing. Right. OK, we've taken all the screws out, and we also had to take out four screws that were holding this, going straight through here, straight through onto the chassis and holding that down too. And now look, the board is actually loose, so we've made a little bit of progress here. Now, are we going to be able to get it out? Knowing GK, no, they'll have made it just so that you can't get the board out. And uh, what's stopping that going back a bit further than that? Right, it was just kind of hooked over some pillars, so that actually now is kind of loose. Um, I think we probably need to take this out. 
here and these two out here just to make our life a little bit easier. I don't think there's any doubt about which way these will go in. Can't confuse those, I don't think that that's alright, we'll leave that like that. And this one, this five way is a little bit That gets that out of the way. Now I think we'll be slightly better placed to swing this up. I'm hoping to sort of just be able to turn this upside down without undoing all this lot. Yes, we can, that's good. So now that's given us access to, to these pins here. I'm just going to have a quick look on there to see, make sure there aren't any blown tracks and that type of thing which will make our life a little bit uh, tricky. That, that looks very clean underneath there. I can't see any obvious uh, tracks. All looks pretty good. So now it's just, just a question of getting this, this out here. I think the first thing I'm going to do is to take this screw off of here, which is holding it to the heat sink. Put that there. And uh, it's got a... Yes, I'll just leave the um, insulating washer in position there. No, no need to take that off. Now, it's not going to help us terribly. It's much easier if you can just cut these out and then desolder each pin at a time rather than trying to get a complete clean desolder on. Two, four, six, 8, 10, 15 pins or whatever, so that you can just lift the chip out. Very hard to do that. So I think we can just um, cut these, like so. Like that. And uh, unfortunately, that's, oh, that's a real pity that we, we're not going to be able to get in there to cut the the other pins, they are right down onto the board. What a shame. Which means we are going to have to try to desolder these, this back row of pins here. And that's not easy to do, I don't mind telling you. The other thing you can do sometimes, which I will just try, is you can uh, kind of stress, stress the, uh, the legs like this. And um, sometimes you get lucky and they they kind of break because they're not really designed to do this kind of thing. It would be quite nice if that did happen and we did get lucky. We're not doing any damage to solder joints underneath. Ooh, it is feeling, getting a bit loose. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, look at that. Nice little technique, that. So that has come off now. And you can see, look, the end of it there, how blown apart that is. Nice kind of smoke mark here. So that is well knackered. That's good. So now this does make our life a lot easier. You might think it's you know relatively simple to desolder those but but it isn't. Little tiny little tiny pads you can use desoldering wick of course which I would even a desoldering tool doesn't really work. So now the technique is to um, kind of what I what I do is I you know I try to grab hold of one like like this, and then get the iron on the other side of that pin and then pull this pull that particular pin out and then keep going along until you've got them all out. And then of course you can go along with some desoldering braid underneath and uh, clean up the holes. None of this is trivial, people. If you haven't done this before. Uh, I suggest you don't try it. It's you know kind of pulling on decades of experience here to, uh, to get this chip out. I just do one for you there and you can see there that 
I managed to do exactly what I said. Just pull that pin out there by desoldering it on the other side. So now I'm going to do all of those if I can <laughs> and uh, see if we can get every single pin out ready for cleaning up. Okay, it took about half an hour of very tricky detailed work to pull each of those pins out. And the technique was to grab hold of the stub of the pin with this pull from the other side of course pull whilst desoldering and then the pin pin came out um, here's a kind of motley selection of them here so now we're in a position that we can clean up that uh, track there with some desoldering braid to hopefully <laughs> open up the hole on each one again sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't okay we're going to have a go with some Kemwick desoldering braid to see if those holes will prove amenable to being cleared of their residual solder. Pick one at random, see how we get on. Nope. Nope. Yes, so I've cleared one hole. So that's promising in that it uh, looks like it's going to be possible. So let me just go down now and see if I get fortunate and all the solder is uh, wicked away from the remaining holes. And then, of course, we can put our, our new chip in. Excellent news. That went extremely well and all of those holes are now free of solder ready for us to put our new chip in. I absolutely love this stuff. I'm not a shill for it or any product whatsoever. I don't get paid anything whatsoever for my YouTube videos either from YouTube or from anybody else. So anything I recommend comes straight from the heart. Kemwick um, desoldering braid. Absolutely superb stuff. Accept no alternatives. There you go. So now we can get our new chip and uh, I'm going to put a little bit of a heatsink compound on there. I'm hoping that's just going to slot right in. Then we can put that um, screw back in and then we can solder it and see what happens. <laughs> Need to get some more of this. I'm getting down to the end of my tube. I've only had that since about 1982, honestly. Doesn't last at all, does it? Little tiny smear, not too much. Don't go slathering it on. Little thin smear of that. And now we can offer the chip up and hopefully. Look at that, that drops in there quite nicely. And that lines up, so let's put our nut and bolt back in. You don't need me to tell you this, but don't solder that in before you try and put this <laughs> screw back in. Let's put this back in first. This is going too easily. I'm nervous. There we go, that's perfect. And now we can just go along and solder on, on the underside. I won't bore you with that. Put it all back together, plug it all in, and uh, see if it goes kaboom again. I mean, why did it blow up in the first place? No idea. So there we go. Chip soldered in here. And uh, we are ready to reassemble and see if it works. Right, we're not going to get too carried away with uh, putting it back together. We'll just put a couple of nuts on the back of here to hold the board in place. Um, I wonder if the board is grounded somewhere. Yeah, maybe we'll put the board screws back in.
There are no schematics available that I'm aware of for GK stuff. And uh, anyway, this can go back into here if I remember rightly. to go in here. They haven't changed their orientation so that's okay. That goes in there. Uh, don't think there's anything else. Obviously I've got some screws to put back in but uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. So I think what I'm going to do is put it on the Variac and power it up very very slowly and feel whether this chip here is getting hot. And if it starts to get hot we know we've got a problem. Did it oscillate? That that would be one example of why it would go um, go faulty. We just don't know why it went. So that's what we'll do. Right. So we've got the Verac here. Uh, I think I'll change. Um, no, I'll leave the camera angle here. Right. The uh, Verac is on. We plug in here. The mains. I suppose we may as well connect a speaker. Might be able to, but this tweeter doesn't feed these speaker outputs that I'm connecting into here. This is a jack output. Tweeter doesn't go anywhere near there. It goes under one of the pins of these speak ons here. I don't know which one. And you need a proper four way speak on to connect, and you need to know which the connections are. Needless to say, this has special Gallin Kruger ultra expensive £100 leads that goes go with it. So, um, Right, so we can, we are turned on, I'm going to turn up to the absolute minimum, which is 40 volts. I can put my fingers in here because it's only, uh, I'm nowhere near the mains, and we're only talking plus or minus 50 volts or something on these chips. I think I may as well put a signal in as well, although we're not using this part of the amp, just to make sure the thing is working still. So we'll plug in here. From memory, we don't start to hear anything until we get up to about 100 volts or so. Okay, 50 volts for five minutes. That's 50 volts AC coming in. And um, no heat coming out of the chip. I'm going to go up to 75 volts AC in. Seems fairly cool at the moment. Nothing much happening there. We've got no signal coming out either at the moment. Uh, but as I say, I think this doesn't kick in till about 100 volts. Let's go up a bit higher. Okay, so there's the main amplifier working. Well, it's put up to 100. 100 volts AC coming in. And this is cool. I don't like chips mysteriously blowing up for no reason. You know, if you've been thrashing it at the time on a gig or something, then yeah, I could believe it. That's just couldn't handle the power going to the tweeters. But he was just sitting there working on his computer, and um, suddenly the thing went up in a puff of smoke. He wasn't even using the amp. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I'm confident enough to go a bit higher, say 120 volts in. Nothing untoward happening there. That seems alright. Go up a bit higher. 150 volts going in. Fan's not going round by the way because the amp's not getting hot. I'm guessing there's a thermo couple somewhere which senses how hot the amp's getting and turns on the fan when when it gets too hot but we're not pulling any power at the moment, we're pulling about half a watt with that, and that's probably one watt. <laughs> you need a lot of power when you're um, running a bass amp. I'm sure you know this, but just in case you don't and you're a beginner, um, bass amps have to be much more meatier and much more powerful than 
ordinary guitar amps and the reason is very simple the human ear is insensitive to bass notes as indeed it is insensitive to very high frequency notes and so in order for you to perceive that you have a bass signal there you have to really whack out the power until the ear goes oh yeah no I think there's some bass there and so that's why you need really meaty bass amplifiers the lower the frequency of course the less sensitive we are to it well this is uh, cool as the proverbial so I feel okay to come up to 200 volts I'd love to be able to stick something on the, on the end of here and, and uh, you know measure measure an output but I'm afraid I just don't know what these four-way speak ons are doing they're labeled plus two and minus two plus one and minus one so those are the two circuits if you like it's not easy to clip onto there with a crop clip or anything I don't have a four-way speak on I've never never had an amp like this you know with which takes out both signals on on one speak on now we've got 200 volts going in that's interesting some of these transistors are warm these ones here are warm not hot by any stretch I can feel the warmth coming off of those nothing on the heat sink that's totally cold I think this um this chip is warmer than ambient you know just I can just feel a little bit of warmth there which is kind of what I'd expect really all right let's come up to full power I'm going to bypass the variac that's full power there's the main amp working and uh, I'm just going to leave it there now for half an hour or so I'll be happy if this chip gets a little bit warm actually you know I'd expect it to get a little bit warm these are a little bit warm but certainly not going kaboom is it so let's leave that on for a while and see if it behaves itself we may just get lucky with this I feel confident enough by the way to put the rest of the nuts and bolts and screws and things in so I think I'll do that as well um, I'm not going to take this out again anyway if that blows up I'm not doing anything more with the amp right we've been on full voltage for an hour and everything is nicely warm um, by that I mean I can feel warmth coming out of this chip and these transistors are warm nothing's hot and I'm sort of happy about that because if that was completely stone cold that chip I'd be thinking well it's not getting any power the voltage to it's gone or something I just don't know but it feels exactly how I'd expect it to feel that chip um, so there we go uh, nothing that we can do now until the client comes in with the special leads and the special speaker for this well, I'm feeling you know happy about that it didn't immediately blow up and who knows it may even work that's all we can do on this amp um, I will uh, leave it now until the client comes in well in case you think I'm moaning unnecessarily about Galleon Kruger here's an, a typical flipping situation here I've been half an hour just trying to put this grill back on which has got four screws I just couldn't find a screw to fit, they just seem to be really tight in here. And eventually I found out, have a look over here, here are some of the case screws which hold the lid down onto the, th the chassis and uh, as you can probably see they look pretty identical but they're not identical. These four here are for this this fan cover and they are infinitesimally smaller thread not even 1M number, maybe half an M number or something different to the screws that hold the chassis on and those screws won't fit into these holes here. Why on earth have they done that? What's wrong with just having a standard thread size? That, that is completely typical of what I find with GK stuff. Um, I just don't understand it. Anyway, finally found out that these four screws here fit. So I'm going to put, the back, put that back together now I was able to test this, which is good, by effectively crock clipping on, well putting the scope on on the pins of this four pin uh, speak on connection here and uh, we're getting high frequency signal out of one of the pins and full range signal out of the other. So I'm fairly confident now that replacing this has worked 
and I can now put the whole thing back together and send it back to the client. Why it blew up, we have no idea. I'm hoping it doesn't blow up when he connects it to his cab or something. Maybe there's something wrong with his cab, maybe. So we have actually achieved a fix on this. Miracle of miracles. Um, but, you know, go figure. So I'll sign off on this one now. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And thanks, as always, for watching. I'll catch you on the next exciting instalment.